Hello everybody. Welcome back to the channel where we talk about stuff. Um, I recently was having a lunch. I want to say lunch with a friend. Um, one of my crypto investing friends. Hello, if you're watching. Um, and we were, I had, actually hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks. So we were, it's really funny. We, we do this thing where it's like, hey, what's up? What's going on? So money. And then there's like kind of all that we talk about over the course of a five, six hour period. It's quite normal and dramatic, I guess. Um, we were discussing the cryptocurrency market, where things had gone, what we were thinking of buying, what we had purchased. It was an, it, the whole game. We ran through it because I hadn't seen him in a while. Um, and one of the things that he mentioned is that, so first of all, this is his first real cycle. Everything that he had gone through before was towards the tail end of 2021. So he got into NFTs, I think summer 2021. He got into crypto maybe the end of spring 2021, like as far as like actually putting money into the market. So he knew what it was like to buy coins, have the prices go up really high. He didn't experience the first half of the bull market and he saw prices going down. So over the last two years, he was, I don't want to say he was a bear, but he was definitely one of the people who was like, I'm going to wait and see what happens. Because he hadn't experienced the market in its entirety before. It was literally at the tail end of a cycle. So as he has been seeing the last couple of months that the markets have been going up, he's been buying a number of altcoins, he's been buying crypto, you name it, he's like back into the market. And we were discussing the idea of uh, being early and exactly where we were. So as I've been in the market longer than him, I'll give you from my perspective as opposed to like giving you the entirety of the conversation. And I was telling him that when I got into crypto, when I first found out about it was around 2013, 2014, and I was terrified of it because everything that I had heard was that crypto was terrible, crypto was evil, crypto is horrible, it's only used by criminals. And the idea of like touching something that was for criminals or using illicit purposes, I was like, I'd, mm, I'd rather not get involved in that in any sort of way. Around 2016, I began to look at the market and I was like, maybe I should throw five bucks in here. Maybe I should throw some money in here. And I think I started my other uh, channel, The Modern Investor. I think it was the end of 2016, I want to say. It was kind of like an experiment. I wanted to see where the market was, if anybody would watch that entire thing, etc., cetera, et cetera. I explained to him that since I had gotten into the market, so much had changed, that we had evolved so quickly. And I mean, really, really fast. For those of you who don't know the exact time frame, Bitcoin has been around for more or less, like just about 15 years, like in its entirety. It was created before, then was finally like mined a couple of months later. So we tend to say 15 years is like the round figure, if you will, for how long that Bitcoin has been out. And since we've gotten this far, an enormous amount of things have changed. We have a lot of <laughs> a lot of millionaires and billionaires who no longer talk negatively about Bitcoin. We heard a couple of years ago that there were apparently companies who were trying to get into the space. Uh, we heard rumors that apparently the reason for the 2017 crypto crash is that rumors were that apparently the market was doing too well. And a number of companies who were kind of looking on the sidelines wanted to jump in, but the prices were far too high for them. So this is why we had the Bitcoin futures launch. The Bitcoin futures subsequently crashed the Bitcoin price. And this is when we began to hear in 2018, 2019, that all these companies and these banks and institutions were getting into the space. And this was also kind of confirmed in 2018, 2019, because of mainly Coinbase, because Coinbase... They, I think they give a little bit too much information. Uh, they and Gemini, the crypto exchange, uh, began to announce that they were setting up their systems for institutional investors. And we were all like, who's the insta what? We didn't, we, there, there was no title for everyday normal people who were in the market. We were simply called crypto holders, crypto investors, at least back then. And then the idea was that we got separated into this batch of retail, normal people, and institutions. And that was around the time, side story, where I didn't really care for Coinbase that much. Because everything that they posted, everything that they did, every new thing that they launched had to do with something for institutions. And we were always told that this thing is not for us. Literally, you can go look at the old videos and go look at the old news articles. When I was telling him, or we were discussing... The idea of where we are now, he said one of the really striking things that really dragged him back into the market was the actual ETFs. 
He himself doesn't have any of the ETFs, as far as I understand. He likes to invest in stocks as well. He wants more stable things, but the, the idea of being able to make like really good money from the cryptocurrency market is, of course, very appealing to, to a, any investor. He said the thing that got him back was the ETFs, and it wasn't just the letters ETF. It was the fact that like BlackRock had gotten into the space. For those of you who don't know, you should at this point. BlackRock is the company that owns the world. If you look into their finances, uh, they are an asset manager of trillion, I think 11, 12, 13 trillion dollars. And apparently, and also the company owns so much stock and so much land and so many houses and homes that they essentially have like a portion of everything. So every major company, if you look at the actual allocation, BlackRock is usually either a majority shareholder, a minor shareholder, or they basically own anything, a portion of anything that gives them value. Therefore, they own everything. That's kind of the generalized idea. They're a gigantic octopus with 9,000 majillion legs and they have it in every single thing. Easiest way to kind of understand it. He said, what really got me was is that when you look at BlackRock's track record and how much money they make. He said they got into Bitcoin for a reason. It's not simply that, and, and I've mentioned this before in other videos as well. This is what we were going over. He said to him, he realized it very quickly. When you hear anything with a mega company, a large institution, a bank, I don't care if it's Apple, Google, Amazon, it doesn't matter. The things that they get into, the things that they do, the same exact thing for really wealthy people when it comes to like buying land and buying homes. They know that these assets are lit, like scarce. Like we, the, the, the old saying goes, we can't build any more land. You know, it, what's there is there. When you think about their level of acquisition and what they do, it's never on a short-term basis. These companies and institutions aren't buying up all the land and all the single-family homes and all the multi-family homes because in a, in a year they plan on dumping them. They understand that. There's not a lot to be made. For those of you who don't know, and I had this conversation with a couple of people before, and it was like walking into a wall. A lot of people say, well, can they just build more homes? And this is, I, I'm, I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart and my brain, we need a certain amount of land that also has trees on it because we need the oxygen from it. So there are li literally places and cities around the world where like there's like a, like a not a barrier, but like, you know, a certain level of where you can build and all the rest, we need the oxygen. And a lot of people don't agree with that. And I'm not sure how you made it this far on this planet. Like, I literally can't mentally understand that. And he was saying it's the same exact thing when it comes to Bitcoin. He said he realizes the number 21 million. Cool. Got it. You understand that it's scarce. But he said he didn't really, it didn't really hit him that hard until he heard that BlackRock and Fidelity were holding over 100,000 Bitcoin. And he's like, I've realized all of a sudden why they were getting into it. I understand the, the, the significance of the having, but it didn't really play into my mind until I realized that there wasn't a lot of Bitcoin. They're holding a vast majority of the Bitcoin and also that the having is coming. If, if you've never seen the, there's a chart for the Bitcoin issuance rate, it looks hyper dramatic because it, where's my finger? There we go. It starts out like kind of over here. And like every single having it goes down and eventually it just kind of flatlines. And I think we're two havings away from the actual like flat line. If you, the camera cuts off every now and again, I'm sorry, from the actual flat line. And this is when people, if you look at any type of uh, price predictions or price expectations for Bitcoin and the wider cryptocurrency market, it's always 2024, 2028, 2032. 2032 is when all the price predictions have us between a one to $10 million Bitcoin. It's because of the actual scarcity. We see that there are more people jumping into the market all the time. There are always new Bitcoin wallets. The amount of money flowing through the market, a lot of times one of the arguments from JP Morgan Chase is that Bitcoin has no value. For those of you who don't know, here's a very easy value. The amount of money that flows through Bitcoin consistently on a 30-day basis is always more than a trillion dollars. There are countries and banks that can't do that. And Bitcoin only does three to five transactions per second. The amount of value that's being pushed around for the idea of a system that is not controlled by anyone, that is for the people, that can be downloaded immediately on your phone, on your computer, that you can have immediate access to without having to sign up to something, having to go to a bank, having to plead to someone, can I please join your financial institution, is insane. It's a system that was made by a person or a group of people, and all eight billion of us have access to it. 
That's the value of Bitcoin. It's the amount of money that flows through it. There's been a lot of articles. I usually don't have them in videos because they seem a little, oh, cool. Wow, amazing. There's a lot of articles where they talk about major transfers in the Bitcoin market. So a lot of times we'll see that someone moved like $5 million uh, from one exchange or maybe into a ledger, put it in cold storage. We don't know exactly where all this money is going. But one of the things is that sometimes you see that someone has made a transfer or a movement of money of like $85 million. The significance is, one, that you can move that much money through a decentralized network and like it actually ends up going to the other place. But the other significant part is how much fees they paid for the actual transfer. So depending on where we are in a market cycle, you can see that the actual uh, transaction fee for that transfer may be $8, $17. Even sometimes if it's, now here we go, if it's $47 for one transfer, you go, that's, that's a lot of money for a transfer. I want you right now to try and send $85 million from one bank account to another. Your fee is going to be tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars because that's what the bank can charge you. So the fact that we have a system now that is still relatively, the word's not archaic, like 15 years old, that's as long as it's been around that we're still able to do transfers like that without the need of a governing body except for like the people, us, who can run the Bitcoin network at will and validate transactions is absolutely incredible. Dragging it on back. Rich people buy these assets because they're holding for the long term. When you when we talk about the term generational wealth, it's because they're building it for generations. It's not buying and flipping and hoping for the best in the next property that you buy and then buying and flipping and doing it over and over. No, you buy and you hold. They buy these stocks and they hold them. This is why a lot of times you hear a uh, weird conversation. When you talk about the actual like, um, it's not called generational tax, inheritance tax. I was looking into it um, a couple of weeks ago, and there are a lot of countries that have like no inheritance tax or like it's like 0.1%, like in parts of Switzerland. And the idea is that in essence, you accumulate all these things and you want to be able to pass them on to the next person without them having to pay tons of taxes because that's how you build wealthy actual quickest. So when you talk about these companies and institutions like BlackRock and Fidelity and all these other companies have not gotten into Bitcoin because they're planning on using it for six and a half months and then going... Okay, cool, you know, moving on to the next thing. They understand. If the charts that we're getting, if the amount of analysts who are publicly talking to us, and, and, and I mentioned before in another video, the, the crazy part is that they all have different uh, charts. They all have different graphs. They're all going on different metrics, but they're all coming to the exact same conclusion over and over as to where Bitcoin's price is going to be in 2024, 2025. They all have the same relative numbers. That's what we get. That's what we, and I mean as like normal public people, this is what we're absorbing by all these people. We can only assume that these companies that have trillions of dollars, their charts are probably off the charts. They probably have so much more data that we can't even conceptualize. And this is why they got into the market at this point, because they understand that if the market is going to go to one to $10 million per Bitcoin over the course of the next seven, eight years, they want in right now. They got in when Bitcoin's price was 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000, 34,000. Look at where we currently are now. You can even say like, oh my gosh, well, Bitcoin's 60 something, 70 something thousand dollars. And they go, well, that's cool. We're going to continue buying because it's going to go to a million dollars. That's a 15X from where it currently is right now. Imagine it goes to $10 million per coin by 2032, 2033. The, 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 the price fluctuations mean nothing to them. We are... So early in this market, it is actually inconceivable. I, I constantly have this thing all the time, and, and you can't be too hard on yourself either, like I always am. I constantly have these things where I'm like, why were you just looking at the market in 2013, 2014? Why didn't you throw everything inside of it? Because it didn't make any sense. I look at the market in 2016, 2017. Why didn't you throw everything into the market? Because I was still trying to like learn about everything that was actually in the cryptocurrency space. These companies are throwing everything into the Bitcoin market. It should be actually terrifying for you that two companies are two in in six weeks are holding over three hundred thousand Bitcoin, because that means by the time we get to summer, the end of summer, they're going to have over a million Bitcoin. And the craziest part to think of is that this is still twenty twenty four. 
If that's their level of accumulation, imagine how many other companies are already in the market without telling us or are currently in the market who are also accumulating. A lot of times in the news, we get stuff about BlackRock has half a billion dollars worth of inflows per day. And I'm like, do you understand how much half a billion dollars is? It becomes almost like a uh, you become hyper desensitized to it because you're like, well, it's just, it's just half a billion. Half a billion of anything per day, especially something that's as finite as Bitcoin. When we just got news recently, for those of you who miss it as well, that apparently 7.8 million Bitcoin are lost and gone forever. Over the years, people losing their, their computers, their so-and-so, their passwords, you name it. You should have all this stuff like extra written down as well. Gone and lost forever. If this is what's happening in 2024, this was the conversation that, that me and my friend had. If this is what's happening now, where are we in 2026? How much Bitcoin is BlackRock and Fidelity? How, how, how much do they have? How much do all nine ETF issuers have? There are other ETFs, for those of you who missed it as well, around the world as well. It's not just the US. The other countries actually had their Bitcoin ETFs a while before. And many of them didn't make it into the news because over the course of a year, they had only acquired 7,000 Bitcoin. That 7,000 Bitcoin that one millionaire and one billionaire around the world will never, ever be able to hold or own, nonetheless a normal person. Where's the market in 2028? 2028, think about that. Four years from now, how much Bitcoin are these institutions holding? How high is Bitcoin's price? Every time we see a dip in price, and we've seen it before over the last couple of years, every time there's been a, a dip in price, we see that whales buy up coins. That was one of the major things for, for videos on this channel for a while ago, as I kept on saying, I was like, no. Every time that there's a dip, they buy and people go, well, the price went, went down and it kind of stayed down. And it's like, you're not paying attention. They're accumulating. Like, th this is the idea of the supply crunch. This is why there's not enough, enough left. They, they care not whether Bitcoin has fallen by 7,000, 8,000, 15,000, or has gone up by 10, 15, 20,000, because they're all aiming for that one to $10 million per coin. It's all like sitting right in front of us. And this is what a lot of people, and I, and I understand because a lot of people, their first time into finance tends to be in the cryptocurrency space. So I totally get it. So a lot of times you'll hear like negative news about Bitcoin or something or whatever. Bitcoin's price falls down by six, $7,000. And we see Always in the news, if you follow the other channel, where there's always news that there's like a liquidation of several hundred million dollars of new people who got into the market. It's always the new people. They're terrified. They're afraid. They heard for a while that Bitcoin's price was going to go up, so they got into the market. The price falls by this much. They get terrified and they sell everything, waiting to see if the price will continue to fall, and the price doesn't. The price either stabilizes or begins to slowly go back up because all those coins are bought up instantaneously. We are in a such a hyper privileged position. It sounds crazy because you sit here right now and you only imagine 10 years ago and you go, oh my gosh, I wish I got into Bitcoin 10 years ago. 10 years from now, you're going to tell people what it was like in 2024 and they're like, you got into the market in 2020. That's crazy that you got into this market so long ago. Look at how high Bitcoin's price is right now. I wish... I had enough money to be able to buy a million Satoshis. And that's also, think of, think of the, the stretching out of the actual time frame and where we currently are right now. If all this is happening in 2024, where's the market in 2027? If this is where we are in 2027, where's the market in 2030? If Bitcoin's price goes over a million dollars per coin, you think the asset just going to disappear? Or do you think it becomes the new brand new thing for people to invest their money in? We already see all these like retirement accounts. We're also talking about already wanting to invest in, in Bitcoin. If Bitcoin's around in 2030, that means it's around in 2035. If we're at a $10 million Bitcoin, when, when, when $50 million Bitcoin? What's the price in 2045? Why are all these institutions jumping so heavily into this space right now? It's because they see the long-term prospect of it. The last fragments of Bitcoin will not be mined until the year 2140. Google it. Now imagine you, as a person, you manage to be able to acquire 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 million Satoshis. How much money do you have from that purchase in the year 2035, in 2040, in 2068, which will be a year? Time goes forward. 
your kids, your grandkids, how much money will they have for this system that's still going to take another 80 years, eight zero years to complete and produce the last Bitcoins from the network? Why do you think these people are in this market? Why do you think rich people buy stocks and hold them? They want the dividends forever. Why do you think these rich people are buying up all the property? It's because they want the property, they want the land, and they want the rent that continues to increase. You think they got into Bitcoin because they want Bitcoin's price to go down? You think this accumulation is just like some random thing that's currently happening? Why are all these companies into Bitcoin right now? Why is the, the, the company that owns the world wanting to own all the Bitcoin? We are extremely early. There's no way that I can stress this anymore without raising my blood pressure any higher. Like literally, do all that you can to read. And, and I know a lot of people don't like reading. You gotta find books about the history of Bitcoin, read articles, find stuff online about like what it was like in the early days so you have a really big picture as to what the space was like and what it's currently like right now. Every single time we get news about all these companies getting into the space, I make a video about it because I want you to know about it as well. Every single time that we hear that MicroStrategy is, is, is issuing half a billion dollars worth of debt against the company and then buying half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin the next week, there's a reason for it. They know exactly where this market is going. It's just a lot of times when, it, when the newer people get into the market, it's difficult not to get scared. If you've lived in a world where you've never invested and you throw a couple hundred bucks into a market and it goes down by 20%, you're like, crap, I'm losing money. It's because you have to look at the long term. As I always say, do not, and I know, please do not invest any more than you can afford to lose. I always say, after you've paid your rent, you light your gas, your water, your car, something, whatever, any money you have left over that is like for frivolous spending, something that you know you don't really need, you don't need an extra video game, you have five pairs of shoes already, you don't need a new dress, you don't need a new car, that extra money that you can play around with, that is what you should use to throw into the market. So if it does go down, you're like, Cool, I didn't need that bag of M&Ms or whatever people are buying with their money and stuff these days. We are excessively early in this market. Yeah, just thought I'd throw that out there because I know that question keeps popping up. A lot of people keep asking me. I have a really good friend, hello, um, who also asks me as well. He's like he's kind of getting into the market more and more and more. We've been talking about coins and stuff like that. But no, we are like hyper early into this space. We are the early adopters. <laughs> we haven't even broken 100K yet. We haven't even, at the time of me making this video, we haven't even gotten to the having. So, yeah. I do hope that you've all enjoyed. I hope you all understood. Hope you all are having a great day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, wherever the heck you might be. I do hope it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching, listening, liking, commenting, and or supporting. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.